The Velar is the Range Rover brand's long-awaited fourth model. Equally long-awaited has been a larger contender from the Solihull makers lineup, fully able to properly take on executive segment German premium SUV rivals in terms of tarmac drive dynamics. This, apparently, is that car. Stylishly packaged, beautifully built, and on paper at least, very desirable indeed. This is the most sporting Range Rover yet made, and very much the Solihull brand's interpretation of what a really premium mid-sized luxury SUV should be. If you're looking at something like an upper spec, Audi Q5, Mercedes GLC or BMW X3, but want a car in this class with a bit more substance, something better, something different, then you're exactly the kind of person this Range Rover Velar is aimed at. It's a model, we're reminded, developed directly from nearly half a century of Range Rover pedigree, hence the name, a Latin word meaning sail or veiled, which was on the badging of all 26 prototypes of the brand's classic original first generation 1970 design. The Velar certainly fills a significant gap in the Range Rover lineup, the gulf that previously existed between the compact Evoque and the huge Range Rover Sport. For most of its history, the Solihull maker hasn't had a product platform appropriate for underpinning a more sporting, road-orientated contender to occupy this space in the market. But the launch of partner brand Jaguar's first SUV, the F-Pace, in 2015, provided exactly that. The Velar also borrows plenty else from that model, including engines and all of its media and safety technology, but claims to build it all into a package with a very Range Rover feel. It's slightly bigger than the Jag and slightly larger than its most obvious German rivals too, which might partly explain why it's so much pricier than most of them. Now, that's quite intentional. Land Rover's plan for the Range Rover brand is not only to broaden it, but also to push it up market, which is why the average Velar will sell at prices straying into Range Rover sport territory. Will that be an issue? The company thinks not, pointing out that this is a very different kind of larger Range Rover product. Though it can't tow as much or be quite as able in the Serengeti as bigger models in the range, it does in compensation offer a far more agile driving experience and a considerably superior efficiency showing, all wrapped up in styling that could well see you wanting one before you've even brushed your brogues on the pedals. Sounds promising, doesn't it? Let's put this car to the test. Technology sharing within the Jaguar Land Rover product portfolio was always going to make perfect sense. And as part of that, it was inevitable that new Jaguar SUV models were going to start to use Land Rover engineering technology. I'm not sure though that I ever expected a Land Rover to use SUV technology from a Jaguar. That in essence is what's happened with this Velar. Its basic chassis is shared with Jag's F-Pace SUV, as is its rear-biased 4x4 system. As with German rivals, it's an on-demand setup, this being the only Land Rover product not available with permanent all-wheel drive. Now, if all of that starts to ring alarm bells with you, then to be honest, you're probably not the kind of person being targeted for Velar ownership. The whole point of this car is to attract a different kind of buyer, someone after a more dynamic, style conscious sort of larger SUV, and someone who almost certainly would previously have bought something German in this segment. In the past, they'll have ignored the Land Rover brand, finding the Evoque too small and the Range Rover Sport too large and clunky. The Velar, though, is a very different prospect, carefully positioned between the large and mid-sized premium SUV segments to potentially offer the very best of both in a fashionable avant-garde package. It all sounds very appealing, doesn't it? But there are an awful lot of questions here. Let's start with the fact that with an F-Pace, it doesn't matter that most of the range is based around four-cylinder power because that car sells at a lower price point. With virtually the same engine lineup though, a Velar looks more exposed against the mainly six-cylinder engine models it competes with above the 50,000 pound mark. 
which makes it even more vital that the drive dynamics of this Range Rover product should feel unique and ought certainly to be very distinctly differentiated from those of its Jaguar cousin. So have they been? Broadly, yes. This is a slightly bigger car and, despite a greater use of chassis aluminium than is the case in the Jag, it's also a marginally heavier one. Both attributes are very evident from a seat behind the wheel that not only positions you more commandingly than you would be in an F-Pace, but also leaves you with a better view forward than you'd have in virtually every other directly comparable rival. Plus, as we'll see later, the Velar's drivetrain works with more sophisticated 4x4 dynamics than buyers in this segment will be used to. These aided by more capable body geometry, providing unusually proficient levels of off-road agility and a deeper potential wading depth. Potential buyers, though, are going to be primarily interested in the way this car performs on tarmac territory, something that's obviously going to be heavily influenced by your choice of engine. Scan the lineup list and there's lots of P and D model designations with the figures after each letter referencing the braked horsepower in each case. Since most buyers will be choosing one of the four cylinder, two liter Ingenium turbo units, we'll start with those. The range propped up by an entry level single turbo D180 diesel variant that most buyers will ignore. For the record, it's capable of rest to 62 miles an hour in 8.9 seconds en route to 130 miles an hour. All the other four pod options feature twin turbos, with most buyers likely to opt for the D240 diesel we're trying here. Pulling power in this case is boosted from 430 to 500 newton meters, good enough to deal with the 62 mile an hour sprint in 7.3 seconds on the way to 135 miles an hour. Of course, the lighter mainstream petrol variants do better. The P250, improving the sprint showing to 6.7 seconds, and the Pokia P300, shortening that to just 6 seconds en route to 145 miles an hour. Were we choosing a Velar, though, we'd be minded to try and find the extra cash for one of the two 3.0-litre V6 variants. Probably the D300 diesel derivative, which manages 62 miles an hour in 6.5 seconds on the way to 150 miles an hour and stumps up with a lusty 700 newton meters of torque. The alternative option is an engine you'd almost certainly like, but probably couldn't justify. The supercharged petrol unit borrowed from the Jaguar F-Type sports car and found in the P380 Velar flagship model. This sounds glorious, storms to 62 miles an hour in 5.7 seconds and has to be artificially restrained at 155 miles an hour. Either way, with a V6 Velar, you get air suspension as standard, a feature that's only optional on a four-cylinder model and then only if you choose either a D240 or a P300 variant. We think you really need it to complete the driving experience this model can offer. Now we talked earlier of features needed to differentiate the Velar from its F-Pace cousin. Well, this four-corner air suspension setup is another of them. It raises the bodywork off-road and lowers it by 10 millimeters when cruising at over 65 miles an hour, lowering it again when you're stationary, this time by 40 millimeters to make getting in and out easier. On the move, you'll need to choose the most comfort orientated of the tarmac settings provided by the terrain response driving mode system to get the most from it. Uh, that's the comfort setting that you can select via this unusual floating rotary dial at the bottom of the center stack. On most services, this delivers a deliciously absorbent ride, gliding over bumps, dips and crests in a way that none of its competitors can. Really severe potholes, speed humps and more extreme undulations do occasionally make themselves felt, especially if you go for one of the larger wheel rim sizes, but that's a lot more an issue on Velar models with passive springing. Even these, though, benefit from an adaptive dynamics adjustable damping system that you'd have to pay extra for on the alternative Jag. This monitors body movements 100 times a second and wheel movements 500 times a second. So the car's suspension and its steering and throttle response can automatically be better configured for the road you're on and the mood you're in. 
I mentioned the Terrain Response driving modes. With the upgraded Terrain Response 2 system we're trying here, you get an auto option that selects the best setup for you. But in terms of paved road settings that either package allows you to select for yourself, there are basically two, Eco and Dynamic. The latter option sharpens everything up quite nicely, though not to the point where you ever really feel very happy throwing this Velar about. The slightly light steering feedback and comparative lethargy to engine responses via the standard 8-speed ZF Auto gearbox rather mitigate against that. If you're looking for a mid-sized SUV with the track star responses of, say, a Porsche Macan, this isn't it. For many potential Velar buyers, that won't matter. This Range Rover has been described as a long-distance GT dressed up as an SUV, and there's some truth in that. It's more refined than anything else in the segment, and there's a reassuring heft and solidity to everything it does that puts you in mind of the plutocratic full-sized Range Rover model. There's certainly no car in this class better suited to a transcontinental trip. But is it also suited to the kind of rough road use a large Land Rover branded model really ought to be capable of? You'd certainly be forgiven for having a few doubts on that score in the unlikely event that you were the sort of potential Velar buyer who really cared about such things. We've already mentioned the lack of a permanent four-wheel drive system. Even the stylized little Evoque offers you that option. Uh, there's no chance to add in a low-range gearbox either, which is why the 3.5-tonne towing capacity you get in a Range Rover Sport falls to 2.5 tonnes here, or 2.4 tonnes in feebler variants. All is not lost in this regard, though. Land Rover's engineers know how to tune what they've got, and via three off-road settings in the terrain response setup, that's grass, gravel, snow, uh, mud ruts, and sand, you'll be well placed to take on far more challenging off-piste terrain than you could tackle in most comparable German branded rivals. Especially if you've got yourself a Velar fitted with that air suspension system that we recommended earlier. With this setup fitted and one of the off-road modes selected, the ride height can increase from 213 to 251 millimetres, raising the potential wading depth from 600 to 650 millimetres. The system is also able to lower itself for faster dirt track progress at speeds of between 32 and 50 miles an hour for a better combination of stability and comfort. All Villar variants get the same hill launch assist, uh, gradient release control and hill descent control systems that you'll find on larger Range Rover models. Plus there's a low traction launch feature that helps you pull away smoothly from standstill on very slippery surfaces. A 4x4i menu in the center dash touchscreen helps brief you on slope information, uh, steering wheel angles, driveline torque distribution, uh, suspension articulation and weight sensing data. If you want to go further, there are two additional optional systems available to increase mud plugging prowess. All terrain progress control is essentially a kind of uh, low speed cruise control that helps you maintain steady progress in extreme off road conditions. And if you've a V6 variant, you can also specify an active locking rear differential that's able to optimize torque distribution between the two rear wheels and ease you out of really sticky situations. Now you certainly want these two features fitted if uh, rather unwisely in such an expensive luxury SUV you were ever to attempt to try and replicate this model's surprisingly impressive set of ultimate off-roading stats. Uh, an approach angle of nearly 29 degrees, a breakover angle of up to 23 and a half degrees and a departure angle of up to 29 and a half degrees. To some extent all this is irrelevant and to some extent it isn't. After all, you might easily buy a G-Shock watch and never take it 500 meters underwater, but part of the reason you bought it was because you knew it was capable of doing just that. So it is here. Of course, that's always been the case with larger Range Rover models. The difference in this case is that those who don't need the extremes get so much more to work with in the real world. A world that, in a Velar, 
you'll be able to cruise through very stylishly indeed. Even a casual glance tells you that this is a Range Rover. And there's a reason for that, most of it wrapped up in traditional cues now expected from any of the brand's models. The clamshell bonnet, the floating roof, and a demeanour suggesting this car could conquer the Eiger before lunch. Yet the Velar is also described as avant-garde and simply elegant by its designer Jerry McGovern. And you know what? He's right. You see this best in profile, where the cleverness behind this design becomes clear. It's lower and longer than its larger and smaller Range Rover brand stablemates, with a lower roof height and a longer wheelbase relative to its 4.8 metre length. That final figure is important, about 150 millimetres more than the mid-sized premium segment class norm you'd find with models that might initially seem to be obvious rivals, cars like Audi's Q5 and the Mercedes GLC. The Velar sits just above that sector and is actually closer in size to contenders from the next category up, the SUV E segment where models like the BMW X5 and the Mercedes GLE sit. In other words, like its Range Rover Sport cousin, this car doesn't conform to class expectations in terms of size and it has its own particular style too. That's something very evident in terms of touches like these super short front and rear overhangs and perhaps most magically with these flush fitting deployable door handles borrowed from the Jaguar F-Type sports car. They spring out as you approach the car and retract again seamlessly either when you lock up or when you move above five miles an hour. The sporting swept back roof line is notable too, playing its part in a shape that's the most aerodynamic Land Rover has ever made and making unnecessary a separate coupe style SUV model of the sort that rivals BMW and Mercedes have to offer. Another nice touch on each side is found with fender vent style trimming panels uh, positioned above the front axle and flowing back into the doors as part of a strong shoulder crease that runs just below the glass line. Lower down this black trim line running just above the sills gives the flanks some shape and separates large wheels that depending on model vary between 18 and 22 inches in size. We've got 21 inches here. There's a black contrast roof option if you want it too. The front end styling is memorable too, with a stylized upright grille flowing into a long bonnet and a sleek windscreen angle that's far more rakish than you might ever have expected from a Land Rover product. Another departure for the brand is found in the most slender headlight clusters ever fitted to one of the Solihull company's models. The all LED units wrapping dramatically around the nose with distinctive daytime running lights and a full length black graphic emphasizing their narrow width. Up for the R dynamic trim package and you get a more aggressive front bumper with twin black blades marking corner outlets headlined by LED fog lamps. Step round to the back and the look is quite different from the bluff, squirrel shaping favoured by more traditional, larger Range Rover models. So the tailgate glass is more angled and is topped off by a roof spoiler incorporating special air channels, designed both to cut down on drag and reduce dirt on the rear screen, apparently by up to 90%. More noticeable is this black central graphic panel with its Range Rover branding and slender LED tail lamps that wrap around into the rear wings. Lower down, this silver grey hoop would on an R Dynamic trimmed model uh, arch over integrated tailpipes. Of course, as usual, what's arguably more important is the stuff you can't see. The fact that the engine isn't transversely mounted as it is in an Evoque, but longitudinally positioned as in properly big Range Rovers. If you're into design, you might also be aware that the underpinnings here are borrowed from a Jaguar F-Pace SUV, though the designers in this case are keen to point out that this version of that platform is slightly different. It's larger and incorporates a greater proportion, 81%, of stiff, lightweight aluminium, complemented by magnesium at the front end and a composite tailgate. All of it combining to create a huge weight saving over equivalent Range Rover Sport models of about 225 kilograms. On paper at least, that's an enormous difference. 
Time to take a seat inside. These door handles are certainly neat with levers that incorporate a tiny button, a touch upon which sees them gliding out to meet your hand as you seek to enter and take a seat in one of the most distinctive cabins ever to emerge from a British factory. There's not the significant step up into the driver's seat that you'd usually find in a large SUV, partly because the Velar sits a little closer to the ground than bigger models in the Range Rover lineup, and partly because in this case, the car is equipped with the air suspension most Velar customers will want that lowers the model by 40 millimeters when it's parked. Still, you do get the elevated Sports Command driving position the brand is known for, but this time it's been incorporated into an interior design that's quite different from anything you'll have tried before. First up, you'll notice the two high definition 10 inch central touchscreens of this model's freshly developed Touch Pro Duo infotainment system, or at least you will when you fire the ignition and everything lights up. This is Land Rover's vision of a buttonless future where most of the controls lie in menus behind toughened glass, but you still retain an important analog element courtesy of these configurable rotary dials that float above the lower screen. The left-hand one deals primarily with cabin temperature, unless you give it a quick push, in which case functionality changes into your required seat climate setting. The right-hand dial is for the terrain response driving mode settings. And in between, there's a proper volume dial so that you don't have to stab away at a touchscreen or a steering wheel button to change the audio output of the superb Meridian sound system that almost all Velar variants feature in various guises as standard. As for the Pro Duo screens, well, in most respects, they work beautifully, offering you the ability to better configure the functions that you want to prioritize. For example, it's perfectly possible for the driver to view a navigation map on the upper display while your passenger adjusts media settings on the one below. You simply can't do that with the single monitor that rivals offer. We love the graphic definition and the fact that you can alter the angle of the flush fitting top screen to suit your driving position. Not so good is the way that the lower monitor is set a little too far down the center stack. There's also the issue that both screens can sometimes take a little too long to respond to some commands and the way that the whole setup can quickly become coated with messy fingerprints. Plus, rather amazingly, this setup doesn't incorporate the industry common Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring systems that every other rivals offer. There is a free Land Rover app that gives you a certain amount of this functionality, but it's nothing like as easy to access or to use. Anything this Panasonic developed Touch Pro Duo setup can't tell you will almost certainly be covered off by the instruments you view through the imposing four spoke thin rimmed wheel, above which you can also have an optional head up display projecting key commands onto the bottom of the windscreen. In larger Range Rover models these days, all digital instrument binnacles have for some time been a design feature, contrasting with the usual analog setup you'll find in the more compact Evoque. Now, the Velar range delivers both layout styles, lower end variants featuring conventional dials, but upper end models incorporating the 12.3 inch so-called interactive driver display that we've got here. It's not as intuitive as, say, the virtual cockpit setup you'd find in a rival Audi, but there are a lot of configurable options controlled by touch sensitive switches on the wheel. These allow you to view either one or two dials, uh, a full map, or layouts that prioritize either media or driving assistance functions alongside a digital speedo. The other key aspect of drive functionality isn't the proper shard-like gist it would expected would have been carried over from the Range Rover Sport. Instead, you get the same rising circular Jaguar sourced gear change dial you'd get in an Evoque which doesn't really seem to fit with the feel of what's supposed to be the lineup's most dynamic model. As for cabin quality, well, hidden cheaper plastics are in evidence if you really search for them. But 
Broadly, what's on offer here meets the high standards set by a fully-fledged plutocrat Range Rover, which is praise indeed, and just as well, given the high prices being asked. The embossed cut diamond finish for the soft touch face you're servicing has a really premium feel, as does the design of the intricately crafted speaker vents in the doors. Slender air vents fit with the minimalistic ambience and as an option to the leather trim that's standard on most models, you can at extra cost specify this premium stitched textile material for the seats and doors, developed with fashionable European upholstery specialist Kvadrat. Like most owners, we'd rather save our money and stick with proper leather. What else? Well, there's not much wrong with the general ergonomics, though the swept back rear pillars do slightly limit rearward vision and make essential the rear parking camera that's standard, providing you avoid entry level trim. The seats are good too, or at least they are in the 20 way adjustable massaging guise you get with this top spec model. Further down the range, uh, they do without lumbar support, which uh, does seem a major omission on a car that's likely to be used over really long distances. These individual armrests are a nice touch, though it's a pity that they can't be adjusted for height. They sit above a shallow covered storage compartment that's clearly intended for your smartphone because it features uh, twin USB ports, a SIM card slot and a 12 volt socket as well as an HDMI port. In front of this area lie two cup holders with a third accessible by pressing this Land Rover badge button just in front. You don't get an overhead compartment for your sunglasses and the door bins and the glove box, well they aren't particularly big. But as an owner I'd really appreciate this hidden storage area that's concealed behind the centre stack, ideal for stashing small items out of sight of prying eyes. Time to take a seat in the rear. Now you'd expect the extra body length we referenced earlier and a wheelbase just 49 millimeters shorter than that of a big Range Rover Sport to translate into copious levels of rear seat legroom. But you'd be wrong. The design team didn't just borrow the chassis of this model from a Jaguar F-Pace, but also copied the way that model uses it to prioritize boot capacity over rear seat legroom. Now that'd be fine in a car of this kind fitted with a sliding rear bench, enabling you to reprioritize space either way, but that's not an option with Velar ownership. So you're stuck with the layout provided, which means in this case that there's actually a bit less space for knees and legs than you get in something like a shorter and much cheaper Audi Q5. Though the difference isn't huge and certainly not enough to be a deal breaker for likely owners who'll never have to sit here. This is though where the Velar's price positioning against spaciously large E-segment SUVs becomes a little questionable. Uh, a six footer can sit behind an equally tall driver, but they won't have much room to play with and the high window line might make you feel a little hemmed in. In addition, the rather prominent centre transmission tunnel will also rather restrict the carriage of a middle seated adult should that ever be necessary. On the plus side, headroom is much better than the swept back roof line suggests it might be and plusher models get buttons to electrically recline the seat backs. It also helps that there's quite a bit to take your mind off the ultimate levels of room on offer. A properly comprehensive set of ventilation controls for example, um, useful pull out seat back pockets and B pillar vents, uh, neat roof mounted LED reading lights and a centre armrest that not only incorporates a couple of cup holders but also includes a recess containing twin USB and twin HDMI ports. In this case, we've also got the optional rear seat entertainment pack that provides these two eight inch screens in the front headrests. So anyone sitting back here can use the provided set of white fire digital headphones to watch television, films, or even a journey status screen showing a summary of the sat nav data accessible to the driver. Right, let's finish with a look at the boot. Avoid entry level trim and the tailgate's power operated and can be activated with a swipe of your foot below the bumper, which will be useful should you be approaching your Velar key in pocket and laden down with bags. 
Sure enough, as promised, uh, the cargo area looks large, though in reality it isn't quite as big as Land Rover's stated 632-litre figure suggests it might be. For one thing, that's based on measuring to the roof line. Rivals will quote you more realistic real-world figures measured to the window line. For another, it assumes that, rather unwisely, in what's quite a capable SUV, you've opted to content yourself with a rather flimsy space saver spare wheel. Here we've got a full-sized rim beneath the floor, which reduces the total capacity floor to roof line figure to 531 litres. As elsewhere in this car, issues of style are dealt with beautifully. Issues of practicality, less so. So there's a lovely stitched leather strap to lift the cargo floor and four jewel-like chrome tie-down hooks decorating the trunk area. But there's no adjustable height boot floor option. Uh, this cargo lip is high set, even with the optional air suspension in its lowest access mode. These satin chrome plates around the tailgate catch will scratch easily, and these cargo sidewall handles to release the seat backs are optional, even on the most expensive trim level. If you particularly long thin items, you may not need to use them, as the rear bench has a standard 40-20-40 split that enables things like skis to be slid in between two rear seated occupants. If you do need to push everything forward, then the seats fold to reveal a large area that, though not completely flat, is certainly spacious, with up to 1,731 litres of capacity, or 1,690 litres if you have that full spare wheel on board. Having established that the Valara is a very desirable product, we now need to address the issue of why it's also a comparatively expensive one. To be frank, it was always going to need to be pretty pricey. The asking figures start at around £45,000, and if the Valar had been pitched any lower than that, it would have conflicted considerably with the company's more compact Evoque model. That baseline figure is actually a touch misleading as it applies to an entry-level standard trimmed D180 diesel variant that very few people will buy. More normal S-grade models start at just over £50,000, but the majority of sales will be of SE, or as in this case HSC derivatives that sell in the £60,000 to £70,000 bracket. That's the kind of money that would buy you a larger range of a sport, so it's just as well that the two products are so very different. Unlike that bigger model, most of Alars will be sold with four-cylinder power, and with that size of engine, air suspension is only optional. In addition, there's no chance to specify anything as utilitarian as the kind of low-range gearbox that previously you might have thought would be essential for all larger range Rover models. At least four-wheel drive and auto transmission are non-negotiable. We mentioned engines, let's say a little more about those. The figures after the D and P badging designating brake horsepower. If, like most buyers, you avoid the base D180 diesel single turbo unit, you'll be looking at needing a 52,000 to 54,000 pound budget, the lower end of which would get you the base P250 petrol power plant, with the upper end securing you the D240 mid-range diesel we're trying here. Those variants will probably satisfy most buyers, but for those in search of more performance, there are plenty of other options. For petrol people, there's a Pokia P300 model for around £55,000, and if you can find around £3,000 more than that, you can get yourself into the first of the V6 variants, the 3-litre D300 diesel. There's also a supercharged V6 petrol option, the P380, but it'll be a rare sight because it's only available in top-spec HSC trim, priced at over £70,000. Onto the value proposition, and from a Land Rover company point of view at least, it all makes perfect sense. The Evoque starts from around £30,000, this Velar from around £45,000, a Range Rover Sport from around £60,000, and a full fat Range Rover from around £80,000. Perfect symmetry. Of course, that doesn't mean this kind of size and value categorization will fit in with what the premium SUV market expects. And in the case of the Velar, it very definitely doesn't. 
we can cope with the idea of this Solihull contender being priced six to eight thousand pounds above mid-sized posh maker models like BMW's X3 and the Mercedes GLC and eight to twelve thousand pounds above a mechanically very similar Jaguar F-Pace. I mean it is after all a slightly bigger car. Whether potential buyers will be prepared to spend the same kind of money that would buy them a larger E-segment premium SUV, say an X5 or a Mercedes GLE, is another question. Still, the case for the defence is credible. This range of a model obviously isn't going to interest someone wanting cars in the large SUV E-segment like Audi's Q7 and Volvo's XC90 with the potential for seven seats. Those models really are significantly bigger. We can't imagine, though, that the difference in size between a Velar and something like a BMW X5 or a Mercedes GLE, or indeed a Porsche Cayenne, a Maserati Levante, a Jeep Grand Cherokee, a Lexus RX or a Volkswagen Touareg, is something most potential owners would really notice in day-to-day -day ownership. All of these five-seat only large sector contenders are very comparably priced against this car, and all of them struggle to match the style, efficiency, interior technology, and 4x4 prowess of a Velar. If that argument appeals to you as much as the car it's based upon, then you're going to want to know just how generous Land Rover has been with the standard spec. Well, let's see. As we said at the beginning, there's a price-leading D180 model at the foot of the range, simply branded Velar. And if you go for that, as well as being stuck with that single lowest powered diesel engine, you're also going to need to manage your expectations a little bit when it comes to spec. Navigation is optional, for example, which in this day and age seems a little mean in a car costing the best part of £50,000. Still, at this entry point to the lineup, you do get LED headlights, 18 inch alloy wheels, roof rails, a heated windscreen, auto headlamps and wipers, keyless entry, and rear parking sensors. Inside, there's Touch Pro Duo twin screens for the infotainment and ventilation systems, two zone climate control, ambient lighting, cruise control with a speed limiter, the terrain response driving mode system a 40-20-40 split rear bench, seats with a smart Lux Tech and suede cloth combination finish, and an eight speaker DAB audio system with Bluetooth. Most buyers though, as we've said, are going to be making their choice between the three main trim levels, S, SE, and HSE. In each case, for just under two and a half thousand pounds more, you can give your Velara a sportier look and feel by adding in an R Dynamic Pack that gives you a carefully judged package of additional features. Outside, our dynamic trimmed models are recognizable by a unique front and rear bumper design, a satin dark gray finish for the alloy wheels, gloss black mirrors, and front fog lights. Inside, the R Dynamic Pack gets you bright metal pedals, an ebony colored headliner, special tread plates, shadow aluminium style fascia trim, and a satin chrome finish for the steering wheel bezel and paddle shifters. Whether or not you want this pack, what's most important is the basic kit list that comes with each of the three main trim levels. So let's take a look at that. S-Spec trim gives you 19 inch alloys, a power gesture controlled tailgate, power folding mirrors, and upgraded premium LED headlamps that come with washers and special signature daytime running lights. Inside, there's leather seats with those at the front heated and 10-way power adjustable. Plus, you get a rear view camera and an 11 speaker 380 watt Meridian sound system as part of an infotainment setup including navigation, Wi-Fi connectivity and Land Rover's In Control Apps package. That's a decent tally, but it doesn't include one of the key distinguishing Velar interior touches, the so-called interactive driver display that replaces the conventional gauges you'd normally view through the steering wheel with a configurable TFT screen, allowing you to configure the dials and the display just as you want it. This comes included as part of an SE trim package, also uh, incorporating uh, matrix LED headlamps that react to road conditions, 20-inch alloy wheels, a 360-degree camera system, a more powerful 17-speaker, 825-watt Meridian sound system, and an extra package of more sophisticated safety features we'll cover off in a moment. If you can afford more, you'll want the HSC trim we're trying here. 
This gets you stylish 21 inch split spoke alloy wheels, a park assist system that'll steer you into spaces, and there's also 20 way adjustable front seats with massage and cooling functions, plus a powered steering column, even more safety kit and upgraded Windsor leather, not only for the seats, but also for the doors and the instrument panel. On to options. Um, there's lots on offer, of course, here, but a few things we'd particularly recommend. Four-cylinder models lack the standard air suspension that you'll find on the six-cylinder variants, a setup that really completes this car, making it more comfortable and more capable, both on and off-road. Uh, Pokia four-cylinder petrol and diesel variants uh, offer air suspension as an option, and you really ought to have it. We also think you should have the full-size spare wheel, even though it cuts down on luggage space, and probably also the activity key, a useful thing to have as you can wear it like a watch, yet open and lock the car just by presenting it to the tailgate. We'd get it as part of the convenience pack that also includes a useful load space partition net and rear seat remote release levers. Finally, we'd highly recommend paying the small amount necessary to upgrade the Terrain Response System to more sophisticated Terrain Response 2 status that gives you an auto option that seamlessly chooses the best setting for you. As for going further than that, well, the choices are seemingly endless. The head-up display we've been trying here is worth having, and the secure tracker system would deliver anti-theft peace of mind. Bear in mind that you don't get matrix technology for the LED headlamps that adjust them to road conditions until you reach mid-range SE spec, so that might be worth adding in to lower order variants. The even more powerful matrix laser headlights we're trying here cost extra on all models. You might also want to look at upgrading into a better quality Meridian sound system than the one fitted to your chosen trim variant. As mentioned earlier, there are 380 watt, 825 watt, and 1600 watt options. These can all function in concert with the rear seat entertainment package we've been trying in this case, with its two eight inch screens and white fire wireless headphones. That can work with digital TV too. Also likely to be popular is the option of a fixed or sliding glass panoramic roof with either a color coded or a black painted rear section. And talking at the top, many will want to tick the box for the black contrast roof option. Which brings us on to aesthetics. Unless you want your Velar finished in neither white or black, you're gonna have to pay Land Rover extra for your preferred paint color with a wide range of metallic or premium metallic shades on offer. We've got Forenzi Red here. Uh, you may well want to upgrade your wheel size too, though we'd hesitate to specify the biggest 21 and 22 inch rim choices unless air suspension had been fitted. You may also want to consider rear privacy glass, silver or black painted roof rails, and deployable side steps. Along perhaps with one of the optional design packs. There's a premium exterior pack, two black exterior packs, and an R Dynamic black pack, with all mainly based around finishing various elements of exterior trim in Narvik black. Getting the style of the interior right will be equally important for many buyers, with the key decision for most being whether to upgrade to the softer Windsor leather you get on this top HSC model. A couple of luxury packs will see this hide also extended across the dashboard and into the doors. Alternatively, you could switch instead to the premium textile and suede cloth seat option that we've been trying here, styled by fashionable European upholstery specialist Kavadrat. A premium textile pack gives you both this and a suede cloth trim steering wheel, plus satin chromed gear shift paddles and power folding mirrors, if the variant you're buying doesn't already have them. Elsewhere on the extras list, there are optional fascia finishes fashioned from aluminium, black, carbon fiber, and various wood veneers. Plus on models lower down the range, you can upgrade the front seats to chairs with heating, cooling, or massage functions and 18 or 20 way powered adjustment. You might also want to consider special configurable ambient interior lighting that lets you choose a cabin mood from 10 different colored shades of LED. 
Other extra cost interior touches include illuminated tread plates, premium carpet mats and upgraded headliners, either trimmed in suede cloth or coloured in morzine, ebony or light oyster. It all sounds tempting. If you want to keep box ticking, there's a climate pack that gives you four zone climate control extending into the rear, plus cabin air ionization and a cooled glove box. And there are various power socket packs. While in addition, you could add a heated steering wheel, a power adjustable steering column, a park assist setup that'll steer you into spaces and a timed climate system that'll allow you to preheat the cabin by remote control on a winter's day. And if you want, do it up to 16 days in advance. We'd additionally be tempted by the center armrest cooler warmer box, the wireless phone charging cup holder, the side window sunshades, and the solar attenuating windscreen that'll ward off the summer heat. A few other more general pack options might be worth looking at too. An on off road pack gives you a configurable dynamics feature, allowing you to set up various driving mode parameters to your specific preferences. And adds in the various extra off road systems that you might want if you'll regularly be heading off the beaten track, including that terrain response to setup we just mentioned and an all terrain progress control feature, essentially a kind of low speed cruise control to ease you gently through really gnarly conditions. You might also want to pay even more to add an active looking rear differential that'll ease you out of really tight, muddy spots. Though to be honest, if you're likely to need that, you'd be better off buying the more capable Range Rover Sport model. Plus, of course, many adventurous owners will want a tow bar with fixed or electrically deployable options available. We'd ideally pair this with Land Rover's advanced tow assist system, which helps you to hitch up a trailer and reverse it into a space. Though you can only add that if you've got the optional surround view camera system fitted. Now that camera setup comes with or without a neat wade sensing feature that'll help in the unlikely event you're using your Velar to trek through deep water. As for general practicalities, well, you can of course attach a roof box, cross rails or carriers for bikes, kayaks and skis. And inevitably there are the usual mud flaps, protective seat covers and various useful mats and load space partitions for the cargo area all available. For your smartphone, uh, there's the option of an iPhone connect and charge dock in the center console cup holder. And there's also a click and go accessory system that fits to the back of the front seats to provide a work table and somewhere to hang your jacket. On to safety. As you'd expect from a modern luxury SUV, every Velar comes with autonomous emergency braking, one of those setups that scans the road ahead as you drive in search of potential accident hazards. If one is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Lane departure warning also comes a standard to warn you if you're drifting out of the lane on the highway as does an in-control protect feature in the infotainment system that will automatically alert the emergency services as to your exact location should the airbags ever go off. Other standard safety features may be more familiar to you. Things like Isofix child seat fastenings, a pedestrian friendly bonnet, tire pressure monitoring, brake lights that flash in an emergency stop and a whole bouncy castle quota of airbags. More specifically, as well as airbags for both front seat occupants, you get twin side curtain and thorax airbags and an extended curtain airbag that covers passengers back to the second row seating. Now, hopefully you'll never need any of this, but to try and ensure that the worst never happens, there's a whole raft of electronic assistance features. On road, as well as the usual anti-lock brakes with advanced emergency brake assist, these include DSC Dynamic Stability Control, ETC Electronic Traction Control, EDC Engine Drag Torque Control, CBC Corner Brake Control, RSC Roll Stability Control, and if you need it, TSA Trailer Stability Assist. Off-road, you're more likely to use Hill Launch Assist to get you up steep slopes, 
GRC gradient release control to ease you over the summit and HDC hill descent control to help you down the other side. Want to go further? Well, if so, you'll want to know that the SE and HSC variants also come with a drive pack that's optional on other models. Here you get five key features. Traffic sign recognition, pictures road signs as you pass them and displays them on the dash. An intelligent speed limiter notes speed signs you pass and if set, won't let you exceed that speed. A driver condition monitor checks out your responses as you drive and flashes up warnings to stop if it detects drowsiness. A rear traffic monitor warns you of approaching vehicles if you're reversing out of a space and a blind spot monitor works on the move to stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake in front of other vehicles. On the top HSE variant, there's also a Drive Pro Pack, which again is optional on other models. This gives you three further camera-driven items. Lane Keep Assist works if you deviate over lane markings to subtly steer the car back to where it should be. And Blind Spot Assist does the same with the steering if, on the move, you try and dangerously pull out in front of another vehicle. Even more useful, though, is the adaptive cruise control with Q Assist system. Now here, a radar mounted in the front grille maintains a steady distance to the vehicle in front at cruising speeds and can break your velar, then automatically start it off again if you come across a traffic tailback. Land Rover makes quite a point of the way that the aluminium underpinnings of the Velar do so much to benefit it on the scales. And sure enough, the lineup's headline curb weight figure of just over 1.8 tonnes is enough to make this SUV at least 225 kilograms lighter than its Range Rover Sport stablemate. Now, unfortunately, the reality is that most models will leave the showroom loaded up with enough extras to tip the scales at well over two tons. So to think of this as a light Land Rover model is to some extent misleading. It's certainly quite a bit heavier, actually about 100 kilograms heavier than a typical mid-sized premium SUV like an Audi Q5 or a Mercedes GLC which is why the running cost figures of a Velar are some way off contenders of that kind. Still, it's a slightly bigger, more sophisticated car, so you might expect that. And it's certainly true that its returns are very close to those of the similarly priced sporting SUV that might be seen as a close arrival at Porsche's Macan. Let's get to the figures, headlined by the base Velar D180 four-cylinder diesel variant, which returns 52.5 miles to the gallon and 142 grams per kilometre of carbon dioxide emissions. Upgrade to the other four-pot black pump option, the twin-turbo D240 model that we're trying here, and you're looking at 48.7 miles to the gallon and 154 grams per kilometre. The top diesel derivative, the 3.0-litre V6 D300, manages 44.1 miles to the gallon and 157 grams per kilometre. Think in terms of a Velar costing you around 10-15% to 15 less to run than an equivalent Range Rover Sport, and you won't be too far out. Plus, in rough terms, you'll find that its readings are very similar to those you'd get in a large segment premium SUV like, say, BMW's X5 or the Mercedes GLE. It's a similar story when it comes to petrol power, or at least it is in terms of the four-cylinder variants. The P250 manages 37.2 miles to the gallon and 173 grams per kilometre, while for the P300 the figures are 36.2 miles to the gallon and 178 grams per kilometre. It's a bit of a different story with the top P380 supercharged 3-litre V6 model though, where the readings fall to 30.1 miles to the gallon and 214 grams per kilometre. Regardless of CO2, all Velars are subject to the £310 a year road tax supplement for cars priced over £40,000. All the usual efficiency measures are in place to try and maximise economy and cleanliness, like a sophisticated exhaust gas recirculation system, uh, SCR selective catalytic reduction and auto start-stop for the engine to cut it when stationary in traffic or when you're waiting at the lights. 
In addition, EPAS, electric power steering, is supposed to cut fuel consumption by as much as 3% in comparison to an alternative hydraulic setup. And there's also an eco terrain response drive mode setting that's supposed to focus all of the car's systems on ultimate frugality. What else? Well, active vanes in the lower cooling aperture remain closed in the engine's warm-up phase, allowing it to reach operating temperature more quickly. And the vanes also stay closed at cruising speeds when cooling isn't required, reducing drag. Um, on that subject, the slippery shape certainly plays its part in this car's efficiency showing. Apertures in the front bumper direct air around the front wheels in a way that reduces turbulence. And thanks to this and little touches like the specially designed air channels in the rear spoiler, this is Land Rover's most aerodynamically efficient model ever, with a CD factor of just 0.32. As for engine technology, well, uh, the diesel power plants, like the units that you'll find in every rival, use AdBlue, a urea-based liquid that's squirted into the hot exhaust to neutralize many of the harmful gases that would otherwise be blown into the surrounding atmosphere. The AdBlue tank will need to be filled up regularly, though it can last up to 9,000 miles and your Land Rover dealer will charge you about £30 to fill it up. If you've taken out one of the brand's service plans though, these top-ups are included for free. Choosing such a plan is a good idea, as it sets the cost of routine maintenance in advance. For Velars with the 2.0-litre turbo diesel engine, it means you get two scheduled halts over five years or 50,000 miles, depending which comes sooner. This is because these motors have a two-year, 21,000-mile interval between normal checks. You can also extend this uh, for an additional fee to three stops in 60 months or 75,000 miles, which will suit high mileage drivers. Go for the 3 litre V6 diesel or one of the petrol variants and those intervals are set at one year or 16,000 miles. So their service plan covers you for up to five dealer visits over a five year or 50,000 mile period. A lot of Villar buyers will fund their car through a lease deal and Land Rover offers its own finance for this. Uh, most of these packages include the cost of insurance, but if you buy the car with your own money or decide to arrange cover for yourself, you want to know which group your car will sit in. The most cost effective model is the D180, which resides in group 31 if you choose the entry level version. Go for the S spec and that goes up to group 35. Should you prefer the D240 twin turbo diesel motor like the one in the car we have here, its premiums will be based on Group 39 for the S and 41 for the SE. Take the top HSE and it's calculated on a Group 42 rating. The other diesel option is the D300 that attracts a Group 44 ranking as an S. Pick the SE and that rises to Group 45, while the HSE goes on higher into Group 46. If we turn our attention to insurance for the petrol models, the P250, with its four-cylinder turbocharged motor, is at its most cost-conscious in S-Trim, where it sits in Group 39. The P250 SE drops into Group 41, and the HSE version settles in Group 42. Head to the top of the petrol pile, and the supercharged 3.0-litre V6 P380 scores a Group 45 rating, whichever version you park on your drive. That only leaves the warranty, an unremarkable three-year unlimited mileage deal. That's the same as BMW offers, but it's better than you get from Audi, who limit their three-year cover to 60,000 miles. There's also an in-control protect service that allows you to monitor vital stats on your car from your smartphone and will guide the breakdown services to your Range Rover Velar should it ever have a problem. Also included is European cover and a promise to get you on your way as soon as possible in your own car or in a loan vehicle if the required repair will take longer than four hours. Finally, expect residual values to be very strong. A typical D240 diesel variant like this one is predicted by industry experts to retain around 60% of its original value after a typical three year, 30,000 mile ownership period. Until Land Rover launched the Velar, few would have thought that there was a need for this SUV in the Solihull company's range. Yet now it's hard to imagine the lineup without it. Sure, it's expensive, but the fact that this car has much more in common with a Range Rover Sport than an Evoque makes that easier to accept. In fact, we go further. 
and say that the Velar has quite a few of the hallmarks of the top fully fledged Range Rover model in feel, in style and in refinement. In some ways, it's a version of that car redefined for the 21st century with efficiency, manageable size and road dynamics in mind. Those well-heeled buyers who think of the Velar in that way might not mind what they pay for one. The majority of customers, though, will still need to keep one eye on the bottom line. These people may be surprised to find a Velar costing up to 50% more than some mid-sized premium SUV models you might initially think would be obvious rivals, cars like BMW X3 and Mercedes GLC. Drill down into the detail though and a slightly different picture emerges. This Solihull brand contender is actually much closer in its dimensions to E-segment large SUVs from the next class up, like X5s and GLEs. Here, prices are comparable, and the small amount this Range Rover product lacks in sheer size to SUVs like that will for many be easily compensated for by its more sophisticated interior technology, classier looks, and greater off-road prowess. Are there other issues? A few. You certainly don't get the rear seat space that's normally common to large segment SUVs and the performance of the four-cylinder models won't feel as eager as that of six-cylinder rivals you could get for similar money. The handling still isn't as sharp as you'll find in some rivals and you'll have to accept a lower level of towing capacity and off-road ability to that you could have in a larger Range Rover Sport for not much more. We'd fully understand though if none of this dissuaded you from putting a Velar in your driveway. Chief designer Jerry McGovern reckons this model brings a new dimension of glamour, modernity and elegance to the brand. And if you agree that to be true, you'll probably also think, as we do, that this car does the same thing as part of its chosen take on the premium SUV segment. If in the past you've usually driven a premium German executive saloon, but always liked the idea of a Range Rover, then this is your car. And if that's the case, a whole new ownership dimension awaits.